You're watching The Real Deal with me, George Galloway, on Press TV every week at this time. Now, I mentioned earlier that China will be 60 this week. Few countries have packed in so much incident and history into such a short time. China, we're told, is going to be the next great superpower. Is that to be welcomed or feared? My studio guest, Keith Bennett, believes that China is an example to the world and will soon lead it. Keith, welcome to The Real Deal. Tell me why you admire the People's Republic of China so much? Well, I think that uh, I admire the People's Republic of China greatly, first and foremost for what it's done for its own people. Uh, the Communist Party came to power in China on October the 1st, 1949. Uh, when the Communist Party came to power at that time, China was one of the poorest, most backward, most wretched countries on earth, although it had a history of civilization of 4,000 years, yet it had been reduced to a plaything of, of Western powers. Many people will know that the British went into China in 1840 and went to war with China to demand uh, that they be allowed to sell opium uh, in, into China. And that's uh, just a symbol of the degradation that China was to suffer over the next century. Uh, when the Communist Party came to power, Mao said in some very simple words, the Chinese people have stood up. And if you look back over the 60 years that have passed, with all the tribulations and the mistakes and the difficult periods, that's exactly what they did. Uh, in 1949, life expectancy in China was 35 years. Uh, today, it's 73 years. Between 1952 and 2008, China's GDP has increased 77 times. And so one of the poorest countries in the world has now become the world's third largest economy. And China has done so uh, without exploiting or oppressing other countries. And that, I think, is the, the second reason why I would say I admire the example set by the People's Republic of China, is that it is showing that it is possible to emerge as a great power, not by oppressing and dominating other, power, other countries, which is what has always been done before in history, but by working on a basis of equality with other nations. Well, no one can argue with these statistics, and it's uh, obviously true that uh, the modern China has lifted more people out of poverty than any other system in any comparable period of time. And uh, the Chinese people are much better off than they were. But let's take, as it's uh, 60th anniversary, and it's a momentous occasion, let's take a moment to remember some of those tribulations, some of those mistakes. Most of those are laid at the door nowadays by uh, the very chairman Mao that you quoted. Where does he stand now in the, in the uh, iconography of uh, modern China? Is he reviled, is he admired, or somewhere in between? Well, I think it's very interesting that last night the Chinese ambassador gave a reception for the National Day. And in her speech, the only historical figure uh, she mentioned was Chairman Mao. She, I'm sure she could have mentioned Deng Xiaoping. She could have talked about other great Chinese figures like uh, Confucius. But uh, apart from today's president, the only person she mentioned was Chairman Mao. And I think at root, that is how the Chinese people uh, think uh, about Mao. He, he's, his is the only face that appears on every banknote uh, in China. And as, as you know, China has an awful lot of banknotes in, in circulation now. It's his portrait that hangs in Tiananmen Square at, at the heart of the country. And yes, people feel that uh, Mao made mistakes and that there were, there were excesses. But what people would say is that these are the uh, mistakes of, uh, uh, of, of a great man. Uh, for, for the Chinese, Mao was there, George Washington, and, and their Abraham Lincoln. These, these also were historical figures who were not perfect human beings, who were products of their time. Mao was a product of his time and place. Uh, but without him and the foundations he laid, the modern prosperous China that you see today simply wouldn't exist. Well, you, your uh, phrase uh, very telling one, that there's an awful lot of banknotes in China. Uh, and of course, there are an awful lot of US dollars in China. China possesses more US dollars than the US Treasury itself does. And that leads uh, to some anxiety on the international level that China's vaulting uh, progress uh, will very soon make it the most important country in the world. Any reason to feel that? Well, I think it's a case of how it's managed. Uh, nobody is, is a fortune teller, so I don't think that anyone can 
if we're going to keep the monetary analogies going, I don't think anyone should come along with uh, blank checks uh, on anything. However, the Chinese, I, do, I believe, are taking very seriously the idea that they should emerge as a great power in a way that doesn't replicate what, what great powers have done in the past. And I think China is a, a very big and, and complex society. And, and so although China is now already the third largest uh, economy in the world, it's the biggest holder of US dollars and US treasury bonds, as, as you've mentioned. And it was um, Goldman Sachs who a couple of years ago uh, made their calculations that, that China would uh, become the leading economy in the world possibly around sometime between 2020 and uh, 2030. But even when China becomes the biggest economy in the world, because there are 1.3 billion Chinese people, on a per capita level, they will still be, relatively speaking, a, a developing country. They will not be in a position to dominate the world in the same way as, as the United States it, uh, has been for the last 50 or so years. And I see China more as creating a new type of international relations where I believe that the rise of China means that the United States will be the last global hegemonic power in human history. And what will replace it is a new system of international relations, yes, in which China will be a powerful country, but India and Brazil and Russia uh, and other countries, as well, of course, as the United States and Europe will, and Japan, will also be uh, poles in a multipolar world. This is what the, this is what the Chinese say they are, they are seeking. They're not seeking to replace the United States as a global superpower. They are seeking a multipolar world. Uh, so far, I don't see any evidence to, uh, to suggest that their intentions are different from that. Well, uh, let's hope we're both around uh, to see that multipolar world with China as a, a big part uh, in the leadership of it. Keith Benefit, uh, Keith uh, Bennett uh, and I will be speaking at a Chinese 60th anniversary celebration coming up shortly. You'll get the details on georgegalloway.com. Stay with me. There's much more after this. Thank <laughs> you.